God told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like, like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I know better than my ancestors. Then he lay down under the tree and fell asleep. All at once an angel touched him and said, Get him in He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and he drank, and then he lay down again. The angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate and drank. Strengthened by that food, he traveled forty days and forty nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went to a day and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down their altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, the Lord is by pass by. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks for the Lord, but the Lord was not the wind. After the wind there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael, king over Aram, also anoint Jehu, son of Gimshi, king over Israel, and anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mecholah, to succeed you as prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped the, door, the sword of Hazael, and Elijah will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. And I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. So, in our text, we have Elijah, and Elijah has just come from an epic showdown with the prophet of Baal. Um, at this point, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel are king and queen over Israel, and they have been encouraging the Israelites to worship Baal. Um, hundreds of years earlier, when God took Israel into covenant, he told them not to worship other gods. Nevertheless, we find ourselves in a situation where the Israelites have been worshiping Baal. And one of the things that God told the Israelites hundreds of years earlier is if you worship other gods, I will send a famine to your land to try to get your attention. So there has been a famine in Israel for three and a half years. And in the previous chapter, 1 Kings 18, God sends Elijah to announce that the end of the famine is over uh, because he has come to turn away Baal worship in Israel. So Elijah has this epic showdown with the prophets of Baal. Uh, he calls the prophets of Baal, uh, who eat at Queen Jezebel's table, and said, Let's have a show now. Let's figure out who's for the God in Israel. So, whosoever God answers by fire, that's who's God in Israel. So, the prophets of Baal spent from morning till evening, called upon Baal to answer by fire. Baal wouldn't answer. They engaged in frantic dancing. They cut themselves and did all these different things, and Baal would not answer. Elijah said one prayer, and God answered by fire. The prophets of Baal exclaimed, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And at that point, Elijah, um, out of response to the law, he killed the false prophets as he was supposed to, according to Deuteronomy 13. Queen Jezebel was not here for the showdown. King Ahab was, but Queen Jezebel was not. So King Ahab told Queen Jezebel that Elijah had killed the prophets with the sword. Now, you would think when Queen Jezebel gets the news about what happened, she might turn from her idolatry. She might realize, oh, wait a second. Baal didn't answer by fire. Yahweh did. Maybe I should quit worshiping Baal. But that's not what she did. Plus, Jezebel's heart, she decided, ah, I'm going to kill Elijah because he killed all of my prophets. So here we are. Elijah has just returned from this epic showdown uh, with the prophets of Baal. And he hears the death threat that Jezebel is going to take his life. So he runs about 110 miles from where he was in Jezreel to Beersheba. 
a desert town that produces very little food and very little water because Elijah has decided that he is going to die. In our text, Elijah is experiencing a depressive episode. He is facing severe depression with suicidal symptoms. Elijah is not going to actively kill himself, but we, what he has decided is one of two things. Either God is going to kill him, or he is going to starve himself in the wilderness. So either way, Elijah has determined this is it for him. Elijah is experiencing a depressive episode with suicidal symptoms. Um, I'm going to hold it up quick and I'm going to see if you guys can see it. So, this book right here is called The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th Edition. This is, it's called the DSM-5. This is the number one book for mental health diagnoses in the United States of America. If you have never seen a clinician or a specialist or a therapist or something, and they have diagnosed you with a disorder, this is the book they are using. Uh, it has every diagnosable disorder. Um, so if you take off work and you go see a counselor or a therapist or something, and they diagnose you with something, and they fill your insurance or whatever, and they diagnose you with maybe depressive disorder, or bipolar type 1 disorder, or post-traumatic stress disorder, this is the book they are coming from. So I'm just going to read some of the symptoms of depression according to uh, the DSM-5. So we have a depressed mood most of the day. We have markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all or, all or almost all of your activities. We have significant weight loss when not dieting or significant weight gain. We have insomnia or hypersomnia. We have fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day. We have feelings of worthlessness or excessive or inappropriate guilt. We have diminished ability to think or concentrate. And we have recurrent thoughts of death, recurrent suicidal ideation without a specific plan, or a suicide attempt, or a specific plan for committing suicide. In our text, Elijah has four of these symptoms. Elijah, as soon as he got the news that Jezebel was going to kill him, Elijah has a depressed mood. He has markedly diminished interest or pleasure in all of his activities. He has feelings of worthlessness, and he has recurrent thoughts of death, recurrent suicidal ideation, but he has a specific plan. Either God is going to kill him, or he is going to starve in the wilderness. So Elijah is experiencing a depressive episode. Elijah's depression was driven by the fact that he felt like his life was meaningless at this point. Depression in our lives can be triggered by a lot of different things. The death of a loved one can trigger depression. Marital discord can trigger depression. Experiencing a violent sexual assault can trigger depression. Uh, so many different things in our lives that we go through can cause us to be depressed. And so, uh, in addition to being depressed, sometimes we might not get to that point where we're suicidal, but we might just have a season of spiritual discouragement where we just kind of feel like giving up on God. And in those kinds of seasons, we might stop praying because we've been praying, we've been crying out to God, we've been doing all these things, and it feels like God isn't listening. So we might stop praying. We might stop reading our Bibles because, hey, if we keep reading our Bibles, we keep reading about this great God who's done all these amazing things, who's done all these miracle signs and wonders, and we look at our lives and we're going, how come this isn't happening for me? We might stop reading our Bible. We might drop out of church. We might stop coming to church. Our zeal for holiness might even slip as well. Whereas when we were serious about God, we might have watched the words that come out of our mouths. If we're experiencing spiritual discouragement, we might let some words out that we shouldn't let out. Uh, we might be uh, not very zealous in watching the TV shows, the movies and stuff that we watch. We might even go so far as to trade in our Christian music for some apple bottom jeans and boots with fur. <laughs> Thankfully, at least one person got that reference. It is relatively new, and this church is relatively not, but I thank you that at least one person understood that. So, in our text, Elijah is experiencing depression and discouragement. And so many times in our lives as believers, we find ourselves in seasons where we're experiencing depression or discouragement. But there are five things that happen in our text that lift Elijah out of this season of depression and discouragement. My story today is to go into these five things that lift Elijah out of depression and this season of discouragement. So, 
First Kings 19 to 1. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done, how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah and said, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there, while he himself went a day's journey into the desert. He came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. The first thing that happens in our text is Elijah is honest with God about how he is feeling. So many times as believers, when we face depression, when we face discouragement, when we face stressful life circumstances, when all of these things are going on in our lives, and we can't explain it, we want God to stop. And they keep going, they keep going, and they keep going. We need to be honest with God about our feelings. Amen. That is not the time to go before the Lord with a bunch of religious titles. Oh God, our Father in heaven, great God of Israel, who delivered the Israelites out of bondage, you know, who did all these amazing things. Oh God, I thank you. I come before you with my heart broken. If you realize in Elijah's prayer, he doesn't address God with all these fancy epithets. He doesn't address God with all these, you know, flattering sounding titles. He just comes before God with his honest heart. That's where we have to be as believers. If things are going on in our lives, we don't understand. If our hearts are broken, if our hearts are hurting, if we're bitter, if we're respectful, if we're angry, if we're frustrated, if we're discouraged, we have to give all of that to God. Hebrews 4 and 16 says, let us go before the grace with confidence, boldly, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. In the Greek, that word translated boldly means freedom of speech. If you were a citizen of the Greek Empire, you had the right to go before the magistrate with any complaints against anybody else in the Empire. So if you were a landlord and your servant wasn't paying rent on time, you had the right to go before the magistrate and address all of your complaints before the magistrate. But you know what? I, I rented you know, my place to this tenant, and they're not paying up. They're five months behind on rent. They said that they would pay, they wouldn't, etc. You had the right as a free citizen to state whatever complaint you have before the magistrate. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that is your right as a child of God. You can go before the throne of grace and give your honest, broken heart to God. If you are in a season where you are so fed up with things that are going on around you, don't worry about coming before God with all these fancy titles. Jesus said in Matthew 6 and 7, when you pray, do not use vain repetition like the heathens who think that they will be heard because of their many words. If you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, God's not going to hear your prayer because you come before him with all these smooth sounding titles. God's going to hear your prayer because you're his child and he loves you. So if you're going to Jesus and you don't understand the things that are going on, be honest with God about how much it hurts, how painful it is, how much you want God to take away. And even if you're upset at God for allowing things to happen, take that to God too. God is not threatened by our emotions. He's not threatened by our honesty. He's not threatened by the things that are on our heart. In fact, God knows every word that's on our mouth before we say it. He knows every thought that's in our heart before we think it. So if you're upset at God for things he's allowed to happen to you, he already knows it. Confess that to him anyway. And notice in our prayer, Elijah does not even ask for strength to continue. Amen. He doesn't say, oh God, you know, uh, my life is not better than my forefathers, but give me the strength to keep going. Elijah doesn't even ask God for strength. He is so done with his life. He is so done with their circumstances, he doesn't care. If you're at a place where you literally do not want to continue living, don't be holding with God and ask him for strength for another day. Just present your heart to him as it is. Just present your heart to him and throw it as it is. If you're in a season where you want to drop out of church, if you're in a season where you're tired of hearing about all these great things that God has been doing in the Bible, all these great things that God has been doing for other people, and you're looking at your own life and going, yeah, God, but what about me? Yeah, God, but I'm your child too. How come you're not moving in my life? Present all of that stuff to God. If you're angry with God about things that he's allowed to happen to you, he already knows it, but he's going to give you the strength to overcome it if you bring your honest heart to God. So Elijah was honest with God about where he was. That is the number one step that lifted him out of his season of depression. And we as believers have to remember that we are broken, that we are empty, that we are 
when we are hopeless, when we are depressed, when we are discouraged, when we feel like giving up on God, when we feel like giving up on our lives, when we feel like giving up, when we feel like throwing our hands in the air and saying, God, I'm tired, I'm sick, my body's hurting, my family's broken, my finances are broke, God, I'm sick of this, we have to come to God with our eyes. Beautiful. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. The second thing that happens, uh, verse 5, then he laid down under the tree and fell asleep. All the ones in the angel touched him and said, get up and eat. He looked around, and there by his head was a cake of bread, baked over hot coals, and a jar of water. He ate, he drank, then he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, get up and eat, for the journey is too much for you. So he got up and ate, and he drank. The second thing that happened, if Elijah ate some food. This one might seem really simple, but it's amazing that how many times we as human beings, when we go through stressful situations, we have stressful times in our lives, we might go days without eating. Amen. We might go long periods within the day without eating. Amen. And the thing is, so symptom number six of depression is fatigue or loss of energy nearly every day. So mental and emotional fatigue already accompanies depression. You do not want to compound mental and emotional fatigue with the physical fatigue of not putting food in your body. And so many times, if days are really stressful, we can forget to eat, we can forget about eating, we might look up, it might be 10 to 14 hours later, and we haven't put any food in our bodies. We have to remember to eat regularly. We have to remember to eat on a constant basis because you do not want to compound the fatigue that you're already dealing with with fatigue in your body that's unnecessary by not putting food in your body. And if you suffer from clinical depression, an imbalance that's due to your serotonin levels or errors in what neurologists call your HPA axis, which is not important for me to get into, there is a hormone that your brain produces that actually suppresses your appetite. So you might go 10 to 14 hours and you might not even feel hungry. But just because you don't feel hungry doesn't mean you're actually not. Amen. It just means your brain might be sending a chemical that's suppressing your appetite. If you have found that you have gone 10 to 14 days in your day without eating, put some food in your body. Get a piece of fruit, get a granola bar, try something. And if your body responds to it, eat a little bit more. This one sounds really simple, but you would be surprised how many times we as human beings, when things pile up, when things pile on, when things get really busy, we just forget to eat, or we just flat out don't have an appetite. But we have to remember to put food in our bodies. God made us body, mind, and spirit. As we're nurturing our minds and our spirits, we have to keep remembering to nurture our bodies as well. So the second thing that, that lifts Elijah out of depression is God gives him some food. Man. So, strengthened by that food, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights until he reached Horeb, the mountain of God. There he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have protected your covenant, broken down their altar, put the prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, Go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord. The Lord is about to pass by. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart, shattered the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle wish. The third thing that happens to lift Elijah out of depression is God assures Elijah of his presence in the situation. But notice how God does it. He doesn't do it through a great wind. He doesn't do it through an earthquake. He doesn't do it through a fire. He does it through a gentle whisper. The King James Version says it's still a small voice. And in our lives, it can be so easy to focus on God coming through for us with the great wind, with the earthquake, with the fire. Right? We want God to come through with that magic check for a million dollars. We want God to come through and take away all the pain in our bodies with one surgery or with one pill or with one magic supplement. We want God to come in and lift away all of our problems with one waving of the wand. And so we go through our lives day after day after day and we focus on, well, God, how come you haven't delivered me? God, how come you haven't sent that check for a million dollars? God, you know all the bills that are due. How come you haven't sent all this money? You know all the pain in my body. How come you haven't taken it away instantly? You know all the things I'm facing. How come you haven't lived in my problems? What we neglect is still small voices. We neglect the gentle whispers. God spoke to me, Elijah, during a gentle whisper. God might not blow you a check for a million dollars, 
But all of those times where a brother or sister in Christ lets you know I'm praying for you, that's a still small voice. That's a gentle victory. The times when you go on your Facebook post and someone DMs you and says, hey, I just want to let you know I'm thinking about you. You came across my mind today. That's a still small voice. That's a gentle whisper. The times where you come to church and the preacher says something that you need to hear that gives you the strength to make it just one more week. That's a still small voice. That's a gentle whisper. The times when you turn on your radio and just the right song comes on that lifts your spirit for that moment. That's a still small voice. That's a gentle whisper. The times when you're fed up with life and you don't have the energy to wake up the next day. You don't have the energy to face tomorrow. But you wake up tomorrow and you go, where this energy came from? When I went to bed last night, I didn't know how I was going to make it. But I'm here today and I have energy for today. That's a still small voice. That's a gentle whisper. So many times in our life, we can get fed up with God because we're looking for him to move in the great wind, the earthquake, and the fire, and we definitely get upset. But we cannot forget to count the still small voices. We cannot forget to count the gentle whispers because if we reflect on the still small voices, we reflect on the gentle whispers, we'll see how much God loves us. We'll see how much he cares for us. We'll see that all things work together for good if we love us and we're all according to his purposes. We'll see that the Lord is good and his mercy is endure forever. We will see that he who begun a good work in us will bring it to completion to the day of Christ Jesus. We will see that God fulfilled every word, every promise that he has fulfilled to us. So we cannot forget to count the still small voices. We cannot neglect the gentle whispers, even as we're believing in God to manifest himself in the great winds, the earthquake, and the fire. We cannot neglect to count the still small voices and the gentle whispers that God uses to speak to us in our seasons of discouragement and depression. Fourth thing that happens. So we go to verse 13. When Elijah heard it, the, the still small voice, the gentle whisper, he pulled his cloak over his face, and he went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, Go back the way you came and go over the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael as king over Aram. Anoint David son of Nimshi as king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of Shaphat from Abel Mehoah to succeed you as prophet. So, the first two things, anointing Hazael and Jehu, are part of uh, Elijah's prophetic ministry. But God says, Anoint Elisha son of Shaphat. From Abel and Olah to succeed you as prophet. The fourth thing that happens in our text to lift Elijah out of his depression is God provides him a companion that he can walk through life with. So many times as believers, this journey can get very lonely if we're not surrounded by other believers who can strengthen and encourage us. Elijah was in a unique situation as prophet over Israel. He did not have a lot of people who had the burden of ministry that he had. He didn't have a lot of people who had the calling that he had. And so he didn't have a lot of people who he could confide in. And the Lord had sent him away for about three and a half years to a wilderness to be fed uh, bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening by ravens. So that's not really an experience that you can share with a lot of people. So Elijah's pretty lonely. As believers, we have to let God show us different people who we can trust and who we can confide in. So many times as believers, we sometimes feel like we have to carry the weight by ourselves. We have to carry the weight alone. Life can get very lonely if that's our mentality. God has people in our lives who know what we're going through, who know what we've been through, who know what we're going to go through who we can confide in. We, ask, we have to ask the Lord to show us who those people are, who we can trust, who we can confide in, even our deepest feelings, even our deepest emotions. Even Jesus had Peter, James, and John, his inner three. When Jesus was about to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and his soul was overwhelmed to the point of death, he put all of his other disciples over here, but he took Peter and James and John and he said, Come, keep watch with me for one hour, for my soul is grieved unto death. Even Jesus had his companions who he could look to. 
Ask God to show you the people in your life you can invite who might already know who they are. And if the Lord leads you to talk to them, make sure that you talk to them. If the Lord leads you to confide some information in them, make sure that you do so. And one route that God might use as a companion, God, if you're really going through something that's difficult, that's really hard, God might recommend that you go see a Christian counselor or a therapist. A Christian counselor or a therapist are trained to help you during different seasons of your life. They have studied and they have been through an array of different traumatic experiences. And so if that's the route that God sends you down, a Christian counselor or a therapist can be a very good buddy, a very good companion. If you're going through things in your life that you feel like are too overwhelming, that you can't bear on your own, you feel like the church might not be able to help you, just be very careful and select the right one. Make sure the Lord shows you who to pick. Because just because you have a fancy degree on your wall doesn't mean that everything the person tells you is going to be correct. Professionals make mistakes in every arena of life. I have been personally medically misdiagnosed. There have been people who have PhDs in medicine who have misdiagnosed me. If you've ever been misdiagnosed by a doctor, you know that just because you have a fancy degree doesn't mean that you're going to get everything right. We're all humans and we all make mistakes. Professionals in every arena make mistakes. Professional editors make mistakes. Professional cooks sometimes will overcook your steak or something like that. So just because somebody has a degree on the wall doesn't mean that everything that they tell you is going to be correct. So if God wants you to see a professional counselor or a therapist, he will show you the right one to go to. There's research you can do. You can research different ones on your phone. You can vet the right people. And when you get into the session, the Lord can show you what information you need to grab a hold of and what information you can kind of let go. But just remember that the root of every mental and emotional issue is the separation from God that occurred in Genesis chapter 3. So intimacy with God is the only thing that's going to cure us mentally and emotionally. So even if God uses other people for a season, the ultimate thing that he wants from us is intimacy with him. The ultimate thing that he wants from us is a relationship with him. In the Garden of Eden, when mankind had perfect mental uh, and emotional intimacy with God, we had no mental and emotional problems. In heaven, when we have perfect physical and emotional intimacy with God, we will have no mental or emotional disorders because we will have that perfect intimacy with God. But it's because Adam and Eve fell into sin and separated themselves from God that we deal with these mental and emotional issues and it manifests themselves in very, very, very ugly ways in our lives. A Christian counselor or a therapist cannot solve that for you, but if God wants to use that person for a season, they might be able to help you along your journey to greater intimacy with God. Yeah. The last thing that happens in our text, we go to verse 18. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. All whose knees have not bowed down to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. To this point, Elijah has been honest with God, but his depressive episode is continuing. Elijah has taken food, but his depressive episode is continuing. God has assured Elijah of his presence in the situation, but his depressive episode is continuing. God has told Elijah that he's going to provide him a companion. His made through the present episode is still here. But there's this last thing that God says. Yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and all whose mouths have not kissed him. Elijah's complaint. God has asked Elijah twice what he's doing here. We go back to verse 10. He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down their altars, and put the prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they are trying to kill me too. He says again in verse 13. What are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 14. I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down their altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. So Elijah's complaint is that he's the only one left, and they're trying to kill him too. But we have a problem. Because I'm going to go back one chapter and read 1 Kings 18, 13. There is a prophet by the name of Obadiah. And yeah. in 1 Kings 18, 13, prophet Obadiah says to Elijah, Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? I did 
100 of the Lord's prophets in two caves, 50 in each, and supplied them with food and water. Just before the incident of uh, the showdown with the prophets of Baal, Elijah has been told by the prophet Obadiah that he has hidden 100 prophets of the Lord in a cave. That leaves at least 101 other prophets who are with Elijah. Where did Elijah get this idea that he was by himself? He just had the information, but he neglected in his trial to account for it. But so many of us do the same thing. We go to church, we hear the scriptures, we hear the sermons, we hear all of this stuff. We hear how the Lord has a purpose for everything. We hear that God will never leave us or forsake us. We hear that God has shown his love through the fact that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Yet we get into a trial and all that information goes away. All the church we get in goes out the window. All the scriptures we know go out the window. All the God we experience goes out the window. As we align our emotions and our thoughts with our trial instead of the word of God. This is the last thing that happens that lifts Elijah out of depression. When God corrects Elijah's thoughts, Elijah goes, oh, okay. And at that point on, Elijah's prepared to carry out the rest of his ministry. We have to ask God to align our thoughts and our feelings with his word. So many times, we get into these trials. We might be in church for 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years. We might be able to quote 100 scriptures. We've heard 10,000 sermons. Yet we get into a trial and all that information just goes out the window. All that stuff we heard about God just goes right out the window. All the songs we heard just goes right out the window. We have to retain the scriptures that God has given us. We have to retain the sermons that God has given us. We have to retain the words of these songs. If Elijah, when this started, if he would have thought to himself, wait a second, Obadiah told me that he had a hundred prophets. I know I'm not the only one out here. He would have never gone down this road and pressed in the first place. Elijah had the information at his fingertips. He disregarded it. He had the information at his fingertips, but he discounted it in his trial. We cannot do that. We have to ask God to correct our thoughts and our feelings and bring them into alignment with his word. So many times, when we're spoken by the storms that are around us, we know that God will never leave us or forsake us. But sometimes it doesn't seem that way, and rather than rely on the word of God, we rely on our feelings. We know that God loves us, but we get into a situation and we go, well, God, if you love me, how would you let this happen? Well, Romans 5 8 already says that God demonstrates his own love in this. Well, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If God didn't love you, why would he send Christ to die on the cross and forgive you your sins when he doesn't have to? So we have to ask God to correct our thoughts and our emotions and bring them into alignment with the information that he has already given us in his word. When we ask God to do that, you will be surprised at how quickly depression, anxiety, and anxiety flip. So many times we feel like we're defeated by our circumstances. We feel like we're defeated by what's going on around us, when in fact we're defeated by our own thinking, when in fact we're defeated by our own emotions. We have to ask God to bring our thoughts and our emotions in alignment with his word so that we go through our trials in accordance with his word and not in accordance with neglecting all of the information that God has already given us. From this point on, everything that's happened before, Elijah is still depressed. But when God tells him, yet I have reserved in Israel 7,000 who have not bowed knee to Baal and who have not kissed him. From that point, Elijah's depressive episode is over and he carries out the rest of his ministry. And this is why it's so important for us to conquer depression. This is why it's so important for us to conquer discouragement. Because our effectiveness in our ministry is at stake. Every single season that we spend defeated, that we spend discouraged, is a season that we cannot inspire people to live for Christ. If we're not inspired to live for Christ, how can God use us to inspire others to live for Christ? If we're not encouraged to live for Christ, how can God use us to encourage others to live for Christ? We all have different ministries, regardless of where we are. 
ministry might not be behind the pulpit. Your ministry might not be music ministry. Your music ministry might not be street ministry. Your ministry might need to be a godly husband and a godly father. Your ministry might need to be a godly wife and a godly brother. We all have different ministries regardless of where we are. And our effectiveness in ministry is at stake. If we are defeated by everything that's going on around us, God cannot use us to inspire us to live for him. God cannot get glory when we're always defeated. God cannot get glory when we're always discouraged. God cannot get glory when we're always depressed. So it's really important that we be effective in our ministry. Some ministries you can take a sabbatical from. I can take a sabbatical from preaching. You can take a sabbatical from pre for teaching Sunday school. You can take a sabbatical from music ministry. But there is no sabbatical from being a godly husband. There is no sabbatical from being a godly father. There is no sabbatical from being a godly mother. There is no sabbatical from being a godly wife. Some ministries you just cannot take a break from. So you can't wait for God to make everything perfect and deliver you from everything before you're inspired to live for Him. For God to make everything perfect before we inspire and encourage other people to live for Jesus Christ. So we have to be effective in our ministry. If we are determined to be effective in our ministry, God can help us overcome everything that we have been through. In Ecclesiastes 1 and 9, since there's nothing new under the sun, oppression is not new, suicidal thoughts are not new. But Hebrews 13 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Which means the same God who lifted Elijah out of depression can lift you out of depression. The same God who lifted Elijah out of discouragement can lift you out of discouragement. The same God who allowed Joshua and David to recover from the horrors of war can help you recover if you've seen horrors in war. The same God who helped Esther overcome the death of her parents and childhood can help you overcome the death of your loved ones. The same God who had to recover when Israel cheated on him can help you recover if you've been cheated on in a relationship. Because if God allows anything to happen to you, he already has a plan for how he's going to help you overcome it. Please come up to the altar right now. 